lesson 3.6 today. To keep these hopefully a little bit short, I'm going to split it into two videos again. So first off, we're going to talk about three theorems. Um, I'm just going to kind of explain them. I'm not going to do a proof for any of these three. And then we'll do another video with two more theorems. All right, so make sure you get these copied into your notes well. They're almost word for word what's out of the book, but I will explain them at least a little bit, even though I'm not going to prove them. So lesson 3.6, proving theorems about perpendicular lines. First one we're going to look at is theorem 3.8. This does not have a name, right? When we do theorems that don't have names, all right, you do not memorize them by number, all right? You need to memorize basically what they say. Now these ones aren't too difficult, and you'll notice this is a one-star theorem, so we don't use it a lot, all right? If two lines intersect to form a linear pair, hopefully you remember that term from before, linear pair of congruent angles, then the lines are perpendicular. All right, so this is what our picture would look like here. So I've got two lines, one and two are a linear pair. I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit. All right, so one and two are a linear pair. All right, and if one and two end up being congruent, then we know that H and G are perpendicular. That's what that says here. If angle one is congruent to angle two, then G is perpendicular to H. Now, I have had some of you uh, recently on your homework, you've been putting capital letters and said something like, you know, capital P is perpendicular to capital Q. Keep in mind that a capital letter represents a specific point, right? So you cannot say that. Now, when we use lowercase letters, we can sometimes do that for lines. So a lowercase letter represents this line, this lowercase letter H represents this line. But capital letters, and I have a picture of that farther down, I'll talk a little bit more about when I get there, but capital letters represent points. All right, so if angle one is congruent to angle two, then these lines have to be perpendicular. Now that doesn't work if I were to do something like this and put angle one here and angle two there, all right? Because those are vertical angles. Vertical angles are always congruent whether these lines are perpendicular or not. So that's why it says in here linear pair, all right? So linear pair are congruent. We know a linear pair has to be supplementary, which means they add to equal 180. If these add to equal 180 and they're congruent, they are equal to each other, then the only numbers that are going to work are 90 and 90. Now you could use 80 and 80 for congruent, but that wouldn't give you the supplementary. You could use 180 for the supplementary, but they wouldn't be congruent. So the only two numbers these can be are 90 and 90. And if they're 90 degrees, then obviously they're a right angle. And if it's a right angle, then we know the lines are perpendicular. So that's kind of how we would go through that proof if we actually wanted to, to draw the whole two column proof out and do that. But I'm not gonna take time to do that for this one, all right? Theorem 3.8, so make sure you get that written down and get that into your notes. All right, let's go to theorem 3.9, all right? Theorem 3.9 is two stars. We do use this one a little bit more frequently. It says if two lines are perpendicular, then they intersect to form four right angles. Or you can just say perpendicular lines form four right angles. Now some of you might be thinking, wait, I thought that was the definition. I thought the definition said that perpendicular lines form four right angles. Not quite. The definition says that perpendicular lines form a right angle, one right angle, All right? This theorem tells us, well, it's not just one right angle, it's actually four right angles. All right, so let's look at the picture real quick. If A is perpendicular to B, then angles one, two, three, and four are all right angles. Okay, I'm gonna explain this a little bit real quick. Okay, so here we go. So once again, I'm not gonna take time to do a full proof, but if we have something like this, this is why it would work. All right, if these lines are perpendicular, that's our given, okay? Remember the given is always the if part of an if-then statement then we would know that one of these angles is a right angle. Let's just pick angle one. Angle one is a right angle by the definition of perpendicular lines. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, that's basically what that little box means. Okay, that's the one right angle we know for sure. Now, we know that angle one and four are congruent because of the vertical angle theorem. So therefore their measures are equal. If angle one is a right angle, then by the definition of a right angle, its measure is 90. So if this measure is 90 and these measures are equal, then obviously the measure of angle four is 90. And then by using the definition of right angle again, kind of working backwards with the definition, we would know that angle four is a right angle. So I got two right angles now. Well, what about these two here? Well, they're a linear pair, so they have to be supplementary. We know that supplementary angles have to add to equal 180. That's the definition of supplementary. 
We already said that this one was a right angle and that its measure equaled 90. So then we would subtract that 90 and that leaves 90 for angle 2. So therefore angle 2 is a right angle. Now we could do the exact same type of thinking, the exact same type of supplementary and subtraction, that type of thing to get angle 3 to be 90 and then therefore angle 3 would be a right angle as well. So it takes a little while if you were to write it all out as a proof, but once you have one right angle, vertical angle theorem and equal measures and definition of right angle gets you over to this as a right angle. Linear pair postulates, supplementary, a little bit of subtraction and definition of a right angle gets you over here to be a right angle, and then the same thing down here. So that's how that theorem works. Right, let's take a look at the, the next one, theorem 3.10. Okay, And then remember, uh, the second video is going to have three other theorems in it. Okay, so theorem 3.10, if two sides of two adjacent angles are perpendicular, then the angles are complementary. Once again, this is a one star theorem up here. We don't use it a whole lot. If two sides of two adjacent angles are perpendicular, then the angles are complementary. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I said, you know, lowercase letters represent lines, right? uppercase letters represent points. So you can't just say something like this, A, it's perpendicular to C, but I've seen some of you do that recently in your homework, or even you've put the symbol over the top. This symbol over a capital letter means absolutely nothing. Okay, so you can't do this. All right, if we have capital letters, remember to name array, we use two points. So starting at D and going through A is array, starting at D and going through C is another array. So if array DA is perpendicular to array DC, then angle one and angle two have to be complementary. That's what this theorem is telling us. All right, so let me zoom in on this picture and explain to you why that works as well. And then we'll stop this video and you'll have to go to the, to the next video to get the next couple theorems. All right, so if DA, ray DA, is perpendicular to ray DC, then angle ADC is a right angle by the definition of perpendicular. And then therefore, by the definition of a right angle, we know that it equals 90 degrees. We know that angle ADB, or we can just call it angle 1, and angle BDC, or we can just call it angle 2, so I'll just say angle 1 and angle 2, have to add together to equal angle ADC. The measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals the measure of angle ADC. I'm going to write that down right here and make sure you understand why that works. Measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2 equals the measure of angle ADC. Now, do you guys remember why that works? Why are we allowed to add an angle to another angle to get a bigger angle? Okay, why are we allowed to add two small adjacent angles, have to be adjacent, to get a big angle? Hopefully you remember that way back at the beginning of the year, that was the angle addition postulate. Now we already said that the measure of angle ADC is 90. So then we would know that the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 90. And that is the definition of complementary. Two angles that add to equal 90 degrees. So that's why those two angles there are complementary. And that's how that theorem would work if we wanted to put it into a proof. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Nice short video just explaining those three theorems. We're not actually proving any of them. Um, we may take time in class at some point to actually prove them. I'm not sure on that. Um, but we don't use them a whole lot, all right, except this one. All right, we do use this one somewhat frequently. Main thing here you need to understand is that if you name one right angle, it's because of the definition of perpendicular lines. And if you name more than one right angle, it's because of this theorem. All right, so that's it for this lesson.